So a very good afternoon to all our attendees, wherever you are located today, and a special welcome to our international guests as well today. My name is Steve Ackland. I'm CEO of the data solution company AIM, where we specialize in artificial intelligence-led technology, automation, data governance, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing this webinar today. Very warm welcome to this session in which my colleague Christopher Hill will over the next 45 minutes or so be introducing a topic which we know is a big challenge for most police forces and in fact other law enforcement agencies in data governance digital forensics and that is the retention storage disposal of digital evidence. So let me introduce Christopher Hill. So Chris is a senior data forensic analyst in AIM's data practice and joined us from Southwest Forensics based out of Denver Cornwall Police Force in the UK, where he was involved in all aspects of digital forensics for high profile criminal investigations. So Chris knows all about digital evidence and the challenges that come from an almost exponential increase in data. This session actually is the long, longer one that we um, showed at the uh, showcase last week at the uh, Home Office Security and Police Show in Farnborough, uh, proved very popular and we had requests for actually showing this for those who weren't able to attend uh, as part of a webinar. So that's why we're here today. Now, just before I invite Chris to take the microphone, um, I'd just like to say that this is an interactive session. So please, if you do have any questions, use the Zoom function uh, to raise a question. Um, you can either do that through Q&A um, or through the, uh, the other function, which I'm sure you uh, are all, all aware of how that works in terms of the uh, the raised hand and I will look out for those as we go through the session and what I would do is do my best to raise those questions with Chris um, at the end of his presentation so if you do have any uh, thoughts or comments or feedback or questions please file them over so with that introduction without further ado Chris uh, I'd like to invite you to the microphone and uh, and over to you Thanks very much, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, so as Steve says, uh, today's webinar is on, on data governance in digital forensics. And what we're looking at specifically is retention, storage, and disposal of digital evidence and how we can automate that. So uh, as Steve said, let's go have a look at the agenda quickly for what we're going to be doing. Uh, we'll do some quick introductions, uh, kind of go over what Steve just said. Uh, then we're going to look at understanding the uh, forensic data problem, looking at risks and responsibilities, then data and the police vision for the future. And then what our solution is, uh, data belt, and how we're going to use that to kind of fix these problems. We'll have a summary uh, and then uh, look at the next steps of what we would like to do going forward. And then finally, at the end, it will be questions and answers. So just going over what Steve said, uh, Digital Forensic Governance Analyst for AIM. Uh, I started working uh, as a data forensic technician for Devon and Cornwall Police, who are a part of the Southwest Forensic Collaboration. I uh, became a mobile examiner and then a digital forensic investigator, as well as a deputy technical manager. So I've got a, quite a good understanding of how a digital forensic unit works and the hurdles and challenges that, that we face uh, working in there. So jumping straight into it, understanding my problem, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off my video so you have to keep looking at me the whole way through. But so understanding what the problem is. I think for a lot of us who work in digital forensics, this has been an uh, ongoing problem, how we store our evidential data. Uh, the, we have policies for that, I know, but the practicality around storing data um, is, a, is a quite a big hurdle. And for a lot of us, it's been in the too hard pile for, for a while now. And what I've, what I've kind of set uh, my sights on is trying to take the tooling that we have already existing with AIM and using that to, to, to automate this problem away and, and give more time to investigators who have to deal with it. So these are the problems as I see them, the kind of core areas that we're trying to address. First one is the obvious one, it's the increase in data. So this is the amount of devices that are coming into forensic units. Um, I think digital forensics has grown at a rapid pace in the forensic field. I think most cases now will have some sort of digital element to them. Um, and so the amount of dev devices that have been submitted to the digital forensic units is increasing. And along with that, the storage size and capacity of those de devices is also increasing. I remember when I first started as a technician, I would be imaging, uh, you know, uh, hard drives in the megabytes. And by the time I left, you know, I was imaging mobile phones in terabytes. So that's a huge uh, 
problem, that, that increase of data and how we're handling that data is something that we really need to get a hold of it quickly. And with cloud data being uh, treated as extended storage on mobile devices, the limits to what we can be downloading is ever increasing at a really rapid pace. Any application that uses cloud functionality, well, if the user can gain access to that data, that's extended storage as far as we're concerned when we come to downloading it. So those cloud extractions, we're going to start seeing those increasing. Um, and not just the quantity of the data, but it's also the, the filtration of data. We call it ROT. It's uh, redundant, obsolete, and trivial data. And there's a lot of what we do is, is we, we identify what ROT data we have and try to distinguish that between the data that we actually need. And that's a part of the solution that we'll be looking at today. So it's how we filter, filter that data. So it could be, for example, exports from image files. If we finish with a case um, and we've got our EO ones from a hard drive or we have a UFDR or a, uh, a UFED reports from mobile devices, um, do we need to be keeping all those carved images after the case is finished? Do we need to keep all those exported databases, SQL files? We don't need to keep them um, when it comes to long-term storage. So identifying that, identifying actually the main pieces of data that we need to keep from what we don't is really important. Um, as well as non-evidential data. So that's I'm talking about, we've all had experiences with a big case, a whole load of data comes in, a whole load of exhibits are put in, but how, much, how many of those exhibits are really used in the case as evidence? Identifying that is key because we can then get rid of the stuff that we actually don't need to keep that's not relevant to the case. And then private information. This is one for, I know CPS is definitely interested in this. It's a hard one to, to look at. Um, Obviously, within mobile phones, we have a lot of private information about not just ourselves, but other individuals that may not be related to the case. Now, this is a tricky one because with mobile phones, you have to pass that data out before you know what you have. It's better to catch 22 there. So that private information, um, if we're going to start looking at how we address that, we first need to identify what data we have, and where it is and what it is before we can look to do that. And a part of this problem is, is doing that. Um, Furthermore, when we're talking about the way in which we store our data, if we don't have a good structure to the way in which we're storing the data, um, we may find it hard to go back and find that casework if they're an appeals file, for example. Um, and we also may find that our information management strategy for our local force, we may not be following that. Often, digital forensic units, they've grown organically and they, they tend to be siloed off. Um, from the rest of the force. So I, I think a lot of data protection officers aren't quite aware exactly of what's going on within the forensic units. And so their policies around how they're handling that, that information uh, for the, the police, it might not be in line with what our forensic units are doing. So trying to bring those two together so that we're fo following the policies that the, our police forces has put in their strategy, that's really, really important. Um, and then there's the evidential data and forensic notes being separated. This I've seen this happen before where you know, we have the forensic notes that we have made during our examination on exhibit, that becoming um, stored in separate areas from the actual evidential data images themselves. So making sure that we keep them together is really important because if we want to follow those um, uh, APCO principles, I want to make sure that we are following a scientific method. We need to have those notes alongside and available with the data so that we can come to the same uh, endpoint and create those same reports that we did when we first did that case. So making sure that we have a structured process for how we do storing this data is really, really important. And the, the means to which we st store the data, and by that mean, I mean the, the format of how we're storing that data. And everyone has a different way of doing it. Uh, different formats, storage formats uh, work best for different forces. I know some forces are looking at cloud. Some forces maybe feel a little more comfortable about cloud. Um, some, a lot of forces use tape backups. Um, and they all have their advantages, advantages and disadvantages uh, when, when we're looking at that. So understanding what's best for every force, that's, that's important, but also understanding those positives and negatives when we're looking at things like cloud. You know, we're going to be paying for, cloud's good, it's great for collaborations, um, uh, but you're paying for the upload and the download and the storage. So there's three points there, especially with AWS, that you're going to be paying for. So it can potentially be really expensive. And that calls back to the increase in data. It's really important to get a handle of the amount of data that you're storing if you're going to be spending, uh, you know, uh, using some sort of cloud service to store that data. You do only want to store the data that you really need to keep. And then we have uh, the collaborations. You know, um, in a solution that we're looking at today, I think it's great for potential collaborations where police forces might be working um, with other police forces or just internally between, you know, with your OIC or uh, different departments, being able to have that infrastructure built in 
so you know what you have and where it is. It's going to facilitate better collaboration between different parties. And then there's the increased uh, in cost and risk. And that's, you know, that's time, money, uh, that's um, infrastructure costs. You know, we need to take that into account, um, especially if you're dealing with um, personnel who maybe you might have an investigator whose job has become to archive finished cases. Well, if the data and the case amounts keeps growing and increasing and they have to keep reviewing old case data, that can become a full-time job. And, you know, everybody wants to get on with actually catching criminals and defending the victims and helping them out. Uh, and we want to, ideally, want to use technology, leverage that technology so that we don't have to take the huge amounts of time and hiring extra personnel in order to, to do this task properly. And the other side of this, which is really important, is that, you know, when we're looking at things like GDPR, within the police and law enforcement, we have an exception in a sense that we, keep, we are keeping this data for, for law enforcement purpose. But if we start to keep data beyond when it's necessary, so if a case is dropped, um, you know, or if a, a suspect you know, finishes their, serving their sentence, do we need to be keeping that evidential data? We don't. And actually, more to the point, we shouldn't be keeping that data. That's a really important point. I think it's for a long time, this has flown under the radar, but at some point, um, it's going to become evident that, you know, we, as law enforcement, we may be keeping data that we shouldn't be keeping. Um, and now, then we have that risk of fines. We're going to look at that later on. And also reputational damage. So if we can get ahead of that now and we can start implementing solutions to mitigate those risks and those costs, um, why not do it? So moving on, I see this in, in kind of affecting two kind of main areas. We've got the data governance area where we were talking about, you know, we're talking about our um, increasing costs and filtering data and that kind of thing. And then we also have the case integrity. So are we ensuring that how our exhibits are being stored are stored in an appropriate manner so that we can get back to them? Our notes being stored with, with, the, with our exhibits and making sure that if an appeal is filed for a case, can we easily find that exhibit data and redo the work, produce the same result as we did before? And then sitting across both of those, we have the compliance. We have the GDPR, our own information management strategy, local policies. They affect, they affect everything. We need to make sure that that both sides are, are, are working together to, to ensure that we're not going to be breaching any GDPR. Uh, a little chart that I've got here, this is the total amount of data created, captured, copied, and consumed globally. And we, uh, looking back at uh, 2010, you've got two zettabytes uh, with 2025 estimated to be 181 zettabytes. So we can see that that, that curve in that graph, it's not just an increasing, it's, it's the rate at which it increases, it seems to be increasing as well. So we know it's coming. We know we've got a huge amount of data coming and it's only ever gonna get, uh, we're only gonna encounter more and more. So coming up with a solution now and being able to turn off that tap in essence uh, is really really important because yes we may have lots of data stored from previous cases over the years but the amount of data coming in is so so large that we need to put something in place now so that we can turn that tap off and control the amount of data that we have coming in for the future and then once we've got that under control we can look back okay right what do we have in storage, what do we have archived away? What do we need? What don't we need? It's easier. That's the I think that's the best best method going forward to dealing with this. Uh, this slide here, this is um, a legislation uh, kind of regulation slide. It, I I took it like a month out to kind of really go through the history of of uh, digital forensics and the legislation that's that's applied to it. There's a few misconceptions that I, I kind of um, identified going forward. Um, the main thing though is that. We've got to remember that underneath everything sits GDPR. We still have to be GDPR compliant. We may have a reason, uh, being part of a law enforcement agency, that we want to keep and store data that's legitimate, that's dealing with crimes, and we have reason to. But we have to be careful that we're not storing data that we shouldn't be, so that we we're falling outside of those GDPR guidelines um, and the Data Protection Act, and also protection of freedoms when it comes to when we're storing um, actual information like, such as fingerprints and, and that kind of thing. So the way I see this is I, I've broken it down into kind of three main areas when it comes to this information. You've got the corporate information, you've got policing information, and you have the forensic information. Now, sitting under the policing information, this is where some confusion sometimes happens, is a lot of people sometimes I think look at our forensic data 
and they think, okay, that's MOPI, it's the management of police information. But it, it isn't actually MOPI that applies to that. What applies to our forensic data and evidential data is the Criminal Procedures and Investigations Act, because those forensic images that we create in the lab, they're, they're seen as the as, as, a, as a virtual copy of that physical exhibit. So we treat that virtual exhibit as if it were the physical exhibit. And so it's the, the CPIA that's what, what, is, what we are using uh, to apply that. And, and from that, it's the, uh, the MPCC guidance that they published with, uh, with the help of the FCN, uh, which really builds that foundation for how we should be uh, retaining, storing, and disposing of our information. And the FCN have, have done a great job of actually providing that guidance um, to police forces. And it's what I've used as kind of a foundation for this solution going forward. Now, a bit of confusion can happen because within the guidance, what they've done is they've taken the MOPI retention guidelines and the groupings, the crime groupings, and they've used that as a, as a way to come and identify what default retention periods would be for an exhibit. And we do use that in this solution. So everything here, everything we're using today is, is compliant. And it's ensuring that we're not, again, we're not keeping data, uh, evidential data from exhibits and people people in you know witnesses or victims and suspects longer than we allow to keep it so that we're, we're we're ensuring compliance of the force and we're protecting the force from fines and reputational damage so that's a legislative uh, uh point there um just going over those risk and responsibilities we talked about it already so i won't dwell on, dwell on it too long but the main ones we're saying was the cost in time uh in resources um you know storing you know, if we're storing everything, well, that, you know, how much space is that taking up? Do we, we don't really want to be wasting all that space and whether it's, you know, using a hard drive or you have a NAS, you only want to use the space that you need to use. And then the money and costs that are incurred by that. Compliance, we just talked about that, GDPR, Protection of Freedom Act, uh, making sure that we have, you know, local policies that we're adhering to. Disclosure, this is a, a difficult one, again, that we were speaking about earlier on, making sure that we're not having any un unintended disclosure of personal information. Um, or, and and, and fa a failure to redact that information. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all the abilities of, of data belt and the software that we have today, but you know one of those is redaction. So there's a lot of a lot of future uses we can we can think of when we're looking at this software. And then case integrity, making sure that we're following our ACPO guidelines um, and that we're we're not you know losing evidence on on you know for an appeal that may happen in the future because the tape's worn out or we've lost where the hard drive was stored or something got written over on an as or something like that that we're making sure that we're keeping that integrity the case integrity so looking at non-compliance i'm banging on about this gdpr I'll to give you some actual um, examples i think I'm, we looked at last year i think within the uk i think it was something like 18 million pounds in fines from across the uk law enforcement um from uh for you know uh poor data governance. Um, but these are some of the ones I found. Um, so from 2012 to 2018. So here's some, some examples of, of the fines. And we see basically a steady increase in what, what police are getting fined. And it's only going to increase as, the, as these, the GDPR guidelines for fining has increased as well. So we're seeing this increase. Um, and so the, what I think is important is trying to get ahead of ahead of the, these problems, see these problems coming in and try and um, mediate them before we before it's too late. So data and police vision for the future. This is a few um, kind of excerpts that I've found, um, quotes I've taken out, some of the, the policies and some of the, the uh, literature that's out there. One that stands out to me is the, the police vision for the, uh, 2020 to 2030. They say we must commission new work wisely and avoid the development of new national systems where off-the-shelf products are already available. And so when I came here, I came from Devon and Cornwall Police, I came to AIM and I was looking at the software, getting an understanding of what the guys do here, what they produce. Um, I looked at, I was looking at the software and I was thinking to myself, well, what, what can we do with the software? What problems can we fix? And this is always a problem that I had in mind. It's like how, you know, how we're storing this data, this manual approach to, to storing data. Um, it's, it's not a feasible one long term. And looking at what they had here, I realized, well, look, you've, they've already got the stuff here that can automate this process for us. So that's what I've kind of been driving uh, for the last couple of months uh, as, a, as a project and something that the guys here have done a great work on with the, with the software that I think is really going to be able to help uh, police and law enforcement. So we're talking about data, what data we're talking about. Let's, I mean, getting down into the nuts and bolts of it, um, all sorts of data are relate, we have related to a closed case. 
Um, you're going to have extractions, case notes, maybe you have some emails relevant. So identifying what that, that data is that you need to keep, and you don't need to keep, that's really important. And that brings us on to what we were calling the, the rot or not, that rot being that redundant, obsolete, trivial data. Being able to identify that, I think that's the first step when we're going through and looking at evidential data. So things that rot that you know, come to the top of my head might be, you know, failed extractions, um, you know, exports. We've talked about um, media calves that maybe we don't need to keep. These are these are types of data that if we have the original source uh, 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 virtual, um, how would you say, image of an exhibit, well, we can get back to those points again, as long as we keep those. So those are really the integral things. So we see there on the right-hand side, we've got those forensic images, those relevant case notes. Those are the things that actually we, we need to be, those are the important things we need to keep. We can get back, we can get those exports again. If we if we need to, so identifying the stuff that we don't need, we're using data belt to kind of nice little animation there, balance that out, and only keep those things that we really want to keep. So, what is the solution? What are, what am I talking about? What am I actually? What, what are we actually looking to do here? So, as AIM, we develop a, a piece of software called Data Belt. It's able to inter interrogate any data from any any source, and really, it has boundless capabilities. In this case in scenario, we're looking specifically at digital exhibits, digital evidence, data from that. And as we can ad identify multiple types of, of data, we can, we can use that to identify the key pieces of data that we need to keep. And then we can do, from there, we can start to do things with that. Um, and just as a note, you know, we've, we've been mentioned now twice uh, by Forrester in their now tech reports uh, as uh, some of the leading world providers um, and two years running now. So the data is, you know, is recognized, at, not the data, sorry, the software is recognized as some really good software. Um, and we're, we're really doing well with it at the moment. So going into the solution, what does it look like? Um, but basically, what we tend to do is discover the data, the evidential data that we have, get rid of that rot, that re redundant, obsolete, and trivial data, assign a retention period automatically to it, archive that data, review it periodically and then delete it when it's expired in its most simple form that's that's what the solution is intending to do and to automate that process so that it takes it so that we we don't have to have people doing it themselves and having uh, wasting huge amounts of time and kind of going over this because eventually you know if you have if you have to review that data and that's what what the guidance is saying now is that we need to not only do we need to start assigning retention periods but you need to be actively View, uh, reviewing those retention periods and so what this solution is is doing is it's agile it's it's we're, we're able to constantly look at that retention period and make sure that it's appropriate so there's areas that we're looking at that data belt's looking to kind of uh, uh, help there's challenges that we're looking to help with is compliance the gdpr that we were talking about this legislation um, the evidential integrity so making sure we have reliable storage and making sure that we're, we're being efficient and cost effective with the way in which we're storing our data. And then also creating a foundation for good data governance and collaboration, things like that. So the solution looks like this from a simple point of view. This is a kind of simple overview of it. When a case is completed, we go through that data discovery uh, 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 procedure. We're looking at the stored case data and we're working out what we need to keep and what we, we don't need to keep and packaging that up and then assigning a retention period to that. And initially that's a default retention period based upon some basic information from the, uh, the case, the crime type, that kind of thing. And then we're asking okay, is this data ready for disposal? If yes, it's being disposed of. If no, we're archiving it. And then we're periodically reviewing that data, exhibit by exhibit, looking at that retention period and working out, okay, what happens to the case? And lots of times, you know, if you've worked in Digital Frenzy Unit, you may be finished from a unit's perspective with the case a long time before it actually goes through the court uh, we get through to sentencing. So we're going to review that retention period and maybe have a look at the sentencing. What was the sentencing on that? Was it even, was it, did it even get through to court? Was it dropped beforehand? Those kind of things we want to look at. So we're not keeping stuff beyond when we need to keep them. And then again, the system really looks, once it's done that, signs a new retention uh, date on that, looks at that again to make sure that, okay, we're not keeping it beyond its retention date. So I'm going to give you an example, kind of like a walk through kind of example what this might look like. Let's say we have a case here. We've got Joe Bloggs there. Joe Bloggs, uh, you know, he's arrested for uh, drink driving. Um, and so 
we've taken some some uh, exhibits there and in this folder structure here this is kind of a generic folder structure everyone's looks different but we've got the case there in our completed case work we've got 412518 blogs that's our, our suspect's name there at the end and then we've got some folders here we have exhibit data intel reports exhibit photos some of the folders you might expect and then within that exhibit data we have extractions exports manual reviews cloud extraction so the first process is, remember is identifying what we need to keep so if we open up these folders we have a look what we have we've got all these different uh we've got some different exhibits there now a lot of times i know a lot of people won't mix their they'll have separate subfolders for different exhibits but in this case we could just mix it all together and we've got some different exhibits abc 121 that's an eo1 uh we've got dot dd there file we've got a ufed file from a phone um so let's say we're trying to take and store long term GHI 240, that, that exhibit there, that digital evidence. The first thing you're do, doing is we're identifying what we need to keep. So we want to keep that UFED extraction. Maybe, maybe we want to keep that manual review and also there's UFDR. We've got those cloud extractions that we got off the phone. They might be useful as well. Uh, and also maybe that, you know, perhaps you want to keep the, the actual photos of the exhibit for continuity. Make sure that, you know, no one can claim everything's damaged when it's not damaged. So we've identified what we're doing. And Databot's going to identify those, those different uh, areas. And then what we're going to do is we're going to also link in with maybe our case management system and we're going to bring, we're going to take all the data that we need, all the information we need, along with the actual exhibit data. We're taking the metadata the information about that data that we're going to need and use to process it. And the great thing about Data Belt is it can work with structured, unstructured structured systems. So it can integrate really easy, easily with, with other case management systems. So some of the things we might want to keep is that you want to have the uh, case notes that's going to be really important i want to know what kind of what, what the case number is maybe you have a separate tasking number and the crime reference number as well for your cases uh, who the owner was and maybe who you know and 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 what they were in in terms of were they the suspect the victim or the um maybe a witness in this case it's going to be joe blocks he's going to be our, our suspect so we've taken all that we're taking that, that phone data and what we're doing with it is what I'm calling is we're creating a stored digital exhibit. So we're taking all that, that data that, that actually we, we really need. And we're, we're going to go through this data belt to go through this method here where we take the information from our forensic case manager, look at the police database and then that stored case data where the evidential data is. We're discovering all that. We're going to classify that data, make sure that everything it's, it's, it's understood and then we're managing it. Uh, in in that form of a stored digital exhibit. So when it comes to the next stage is, is we're, we've got this stored digital exhibit. Now we need to understand, okay, how are we going to, what, what's the retention period going to be like? So the, the guidance that's been given out on retention is essentially the first step is, is assigning what, what's called a default retention period. So it's the maximum possible that we would need in this case. So we think about Joe Bloggs, he's, he's been, uh, arrested for driving under the influence so if we go through the, the process is it a possession and making only uh, making only case well no it's not so we don't have to worry about that so then the next question becomes well what is the case category well in this case it's a moppy group three uh, uh crime type and then the next question will be okay was well, this a possession or driving under the influence yes it is so we now know okay that default retention period is going to be three years initially um, so now we now, now the system's automatically assigning that to your stored digital exhibit, and that's great. That means that we're taking we were able to automate that, and we're taking that away from people having to do it. Now, at a more complex level, this is what this is what the process looks like. Um, if you see there at the top left hand corner, you've got the case mark completed. So that's our start position. Now I've put in here this delay period, obviously because you know, if you've worked in a digital, digital forensic unit, you will be more than familiar with in situations where you feel you've finished with the case, but the case hasn't finished with you. Um, and you'll be, maybe you'll get a, a call from your IC, someone calling you up and say, okay, actually uh, things have changed or actually I found out some more information. Can you do this for me? Can you do that for me? So we'll put a delay period in there just in case that we actually, we actually have to go back and do something else for the case. But once that's over, we go through that initial discovery uh, of exhibit data. And we went through that earlier on. I showed you when, when we were going through that file structure and identifying um, that Joe Bloggs' phone. So we, that's what's happening here in that process. We're discovering what we need to keep and then we're deleting that unnecessary data. And then if we look here next to the discovery exhibit data, we go through and we now have that stored digital exhibit. So we go through that and we get through to our retention period assessment. So remember with Joe, it was a driving under the influence um, uh, charge. Um, so we know it's gonna be three years 
and we can assign now a retention date to that. And we're also going to create a review date so that we can come back later on and review that. So looking at that, if we go along, follow along the logic with this, we've got a retention date. The solution, the, the data belt's going to ask, is that, re that retention date expired? Uh, well, no, it's not. We've, we just assigned one, it's not expired. It's all the, then it's going to ask, well, is the retention period more than three years? In this case, it's not more than three years. Um, and the reason I put this, this part in is that I think, you know, depending on, on the law enforcement agency, you may have multiple ways of storing data. So maybe in a situation like this, instead of just storing everything to tape, maybe you want to only store uh, cases where you know it's going to be for 30 years or there's multiple charges. So you're going to have, you're going to start having you know, 30, 40, whatever years. Uh, if you know that's the case, you may want to have a different means of archiving data than if you're dealing with cases such as this, where actually really you're only looking at a maximum of three years at the moment. So you might want to have a different method. Maybe it's just a NAS storage that you're using for those short-term retention periods. That might be a more efficient way of doing it. So this is a point out that we can have different ways of solutions of when we're dealing with how we archive our data. So that data is going to be archived. And then when that review date comes up, where the, the, the solution data belt is going to go, okay, we need to do the, we need to do a review now, an exhibit retention review. So we're, we're working, the data belt's working with our police databases and working with our forensic management systems. So first question we're going to ask is, well, was a suspect involved in another case? And this is the complex thing is that when we're reviewing our retention periods, it's not just about bringing down those retention periods, although in for the most part, that's what we're going to achieve. But in situations where maybe, let's say Joe Bloggs is now maybe a suspect in a murder case, well, our default retention period was three years because, it, because we were dealing with just you know, that minor offense. Now that that suspect's involved in, a, in a, a different offense, we may want to use that data in the future in, this, in a murder investigation. So the system can take into account that and it can extend that retention period in those situations. Now, let's say that Joe isn't, he's just, he was just a drunk driver. He hasn't actually been involved in a murder anyway. So we go say, no, suspect's not involved in another case. Well, the next step is we've assigned a default retention period. Yes, we know what the kind of maximum is, but what actually happened to the case? So the system needs to ask, well, was there a guilty verdict? Because if the case was dropped or if the suspect's found innocent, then we don't need to keep that data. And we shouldn't be keeping that data, more importantly. And we need to go through to the disposal period. If there was a guilty verdict, well, then the system's going to say, okay, so how, what was the sentencing period for? We say a year or two years, fine. Then we're, we're going to take away some uh, of that, that time that we have to keep it. So if it was for Joe gets one year, now our retention date is going to be, okay, so we're going to have to be one year long. We've just cut uh, the amount of time that we need to store that data, you know, um, right down now. And if you think about now, you start thinking about cases that you may have had in the past, the amount of cases you've had, and you think about, okay, well, actually, how much of this data do I have that I actually don't need to have? It's probably quite a substantial amount. So that's a really key, important key feature of what the tool is doing. And that, and that process, again, it's automated. It's doing that automatically. So when it does come around to the point at which Joe's, you know, released, he's been released he, and the, the case is done with now, and that retention date now has expired, we have a process where we would have a law enforcement agency, if there's any extensions, special reasons for extensions requirements, we have a, a, a process there that it'll ask to see whether that's the case. And if that is the case, we'll go back to archive. Um, but Ultimately, we're looking at this, this point down here in the blue is their approval for disposal. So now the retention period's finished, we're looking to do the dispose of that data safely. So what we want to do with this is we wanted to make sure um, that none of the source data, evidential data that we've imaged is ever being deleted automatically without any approval, without a human having being able to look over them. So what we have at this point is we would have a... Um, periodic review where all the data that's up, that the retention data are finished, that are up for, for deletion, it, a report will be generated. You will be able to look at that report, see what exhibits and what uh, cases they refer to that are ready for deletion. And if you was there some reason that you wanted to hold on to that data for, for a certain reason, you would click a, check, a little checkbox and then write your reasoning for why you're doing that with and the amount of time that you are, are seeking to extend that. But assuming that there is no, everything's hunky-dory and there is no reason for that, we move on to that destruction of stored digital uh, exhibit. And we're going to make, well, we'll make sure that we, you know, we're forensically deleting that data. It's going to be 
uh, wiped, zeroed out and properly wiped. And in, in a situation you've got a tape, I guess you just break the, destroy your tape and get rid of that. Um, and then a report log then is issued to give you a life, give you an idea of the life cycle of that exhibit and that data. So you can see for references, what happened to it, when it came in and where it went. Um, so you always have a log for, for what's happened. So that is the, that's a detailed approach to what, what's going on with this solution. Um, every force and law enforcement agency is different. Everyone may have different circumstances. And of course, we can customize the solution for that. So one of the things I also wanted to uh, hit on, as I, I spoke with a friend about this, and we actually had, a, I was kind of showing him this tool, and we had a discussion around uh, tape backups. This is the great thing when you talk to people about these things, is that you actually end up working with people to kind of come up with more solutions, that are more things that you can actually use it for. And because we're looking at this from an exhibit point of view, not a case point of, point of view, we, what we can do is, we can look at these stored digital exhibits and we can group them up so that they're grouped into, into groups that have similar retention periods. And then if we're using tapes, we can store that onto a tape or a hard drive as well, we work just as well. So that when it comes to getting rid of that data, we don't need to go on the tape, grab that data, get rid of it. No, we can, we can destroy the entire tape, just get rid of the tape once it's done with. So it's an easier way to manage how we're it's finding, finding those ways one, to easily manage that stored data. It's, it's gonna be really helpful. So just to go over the summary of what we've been talking about, um, data challenges are huge. Forensic units, you know, um, are coping with it as best they can. Obviously, there's high expectations um, and to do the, you've got to do the day job. You've got to make sure that your cues are down. Um, and ultimately, you know, we're protecting victims of crime. That's our main goal. Anything we can do to help with that, facilitate that, and make sure that our investigators are actually doing that, the, the great work that they do is hugely important. So the challenges we have is the data is being produced um, by forensic units and coming into forensic units is increasing at an exponential pace and we need to get a handle of that data coming in. And then the way in which we're retaining, retaining that data, at the moment a lot of us may be retaining that for indefinite periods of time. Yes, we have policies, but do we have really have the time to sit down and manually go through all the old case data, the news case data and review that data? We don't. If we can use the toolage to actually help us with that, that's the ideal scenario, I think. And then there's that, that risk factor with that data being lost. Um, I know everyone's probably had that experience where you've gone to a backup tape to try to get some case data back and you're sweating it out hoping that nothing goes wrong with the tape so you know having a robust storage uh, methods and formats is important and so what we were intending to do with data belt is we're intending to first off distinguish between the data that we need to keep and the data that we need to dispose of and that's the key thing is we need to dispose of that data and then automating that retention and storage disposal process uh, um, so that the retention periods they're being automatically assigned um, and that we're reviewing that on an automated basis without the need for user engagement and you know i see this being quite a quick time to value um, solution i think you know the benefits from this uh are we going to feel them straight away i mean uh i'll show you this going forward actually if we come to the, the next steps part of it is that looking at what we would want to do um uh, with implementation of this, we look at a, a kind of 10 weeks as being kind of, kind of uh, the average, uh, well, the longest really period of time it would take to kind of implement a solution like this. But the first step really is if, what we want to do is do the health check on the, your, your current systems. So making sure that, you know, what we, what you're using, you're using everything to the best of its ability. Um, I know that, you know, if you work from a NAS, um, and those have large sector sizes and you're working directly from that NAS, well, you know, with mobile devices, you can have thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of really small files there. And if you've got that large sector, uh, sector size, then you're going to lose a lot of storage capacity, just that RAM slack. Um, so, you know, that's, a, that's an important um, thing to, to think about. And we want to assess what your, your storage capability is. So, so to, to get a good understanding of, of where you are, evaluate that storage model. Um, and also just, just generally understanding what your local infrastructure looks like, how the friends unit is, unit is integrating with the uh, broader uh, police force. Uh, and once we have that evaluation done, then we can start to implement that. So install the tools, train those who are gonna be using it. And one thing I think is really important that I would I love to do uh, is also we wanna work with um, the actual, uh, those in, 
responsible for writing those policies. So if you've got ISO helping you to write SOPs for how we're going to use this, that kind of thing is to work with you to write those policies uh, on how this tool would work with, with the data. And then not just finish there, you know, data forensics, digital forensics, it is um, constantly evolving, constantly changing. Uh, it's very dynamic. So that third step is to improve, is to always look at the what, what is the functionality of the tool? Can we expand its use cases? Can we, can we use it for other things? I know data belts used, I won't talk about too much, but it's using a lot of, has some certain digital forensic capabilities as well. So there's lots of different things that we can do there. And then in terms of collaborations, well, how much easier is it to collaborate with other units if you understand what data you have, where your evidential data is, and you're able to move it around. So being able to work, help, help, uh, different forces collaborate with one another and different departments collaborate with, with one another by implementing these tools. So that's it there for me. I've got some, any questions and answers segment now. If uh, Steve, I think you're gonna. Yes, I'm back. So first of all, Chris, thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Clearly you are an expert and experienced guy who's actually had firsthand experience of the problems and challenges with data. And as we well know, data is not just, restricted to law enforcement and, and forensics, but obviously it comes into sharp relief, I think, in terms of how important this particular data is and, and how you manage it and look after it. Um, so we we do have some questions. Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, so I'll fire this over to you, Chris. So one that's come through is about, you mentioned about um, turning off the tap, um, you, you know, information coming in, I guess. Um, is that feasible? How could that, how could that potentially work in your view? Yeah, so I, uh, this came out of a conversation I had with the FCN and we were talking about it and that was an analogy actually given to me that I've, that I've nicked. Um, and essentially it's recognizing that we, a lot of police forces have a lot of legacy data, a lot of old casework that they've got stored and maybe, maybe they shouldn't be keeping it or they're not sure what to do with it. But the first step to take is actually dealing with what, the new case data coming in. Just because of that, we were talking about that exponential growth in data. Well, that new casework, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be huge in the amount of data that you're getting. So getting a handle of what you've got coming in first, I think it's the first step to take. And that's where the analogy of turning that tap off. So if we feel like we're drowning in data, well, first turn off the tap, then we can deal with what we have rather than trying to get a bucket and you know scooping that that data out only for more data to be coming in very good and uh, just to let everybody know again if you do have any other questions you want to add to the list then we will uh, do our best to answer them um so another question is around um iso 17025 so um says that they they like their slide your slide i should say on police data legislation regulation etc um, interested where the forensics regulator and, uh, and 17025 sort of fits in within this. I mean, how is data about, how is new technology, should we say, uh, supporting the drive to compliance um, and making sure, again, that, that a forensic area remains compliant? Yeah, I think, I mean, with that slide, I mean, the two sit side by side. The forensic regulator obviously has their powers now and they're looking to, I mean, they've already started implementing ISO 17025. Um, the the ISO is really there to give us to for us to kind of give set out our standards of practice and how we're going to go about doing things. The the legislation that, that the, the Criminal Procedures and Investigations Act that that's telling us okay what you have to do. An example of that would be your retention periods. It's telling us exactly how long we're supposed to be retaining that data for. Our SOPs from ISO that's that's us saying how we're going to do that. So those two sit side by side. Okay, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Hopefully that has answered the question. Um, in terms of, I think we've probably got time for one more, uh, maybe maybe the other one. Um, yeah, the implementation. So I think probably you, you, this is something we've had a couple of points on this actually, is around 10 weeks. Is that realistic? Uh, a couple of people are saying, is that realistic? Is that an average? Um, has this happened? and taken a lot longer than that. What, what, what are your views on that, Chris, from your experience and from the team? I mean, as you know, I've no, no project has no project has gone further than, than 10 weeks to my knowledge. Um, and I think, yeah, I think, I think that's a realistic expectation in terms of um, being able to come in and implement that. Okay, fine, thank you. And then uh, another question is around um, stored digital exhibits. So again, can you provide, I think actually some of that did come up on the slide, um, but would you just like to run over exactly what a stored digital exhibit 
is going to be looking like mm. um, and how the technology data belt will actually be be supporting that. Yeah, so the, the way we, we want to do it is we want to ensure that for whatever, let's say you took you, you, you implement this solution and you want to take a step back, you don't want to use it anymore. Well, at all times, the digital forensic unit needs to have access to that data. So what it's going to look like would be like something like a, uh, like a zipped folder or compressed kind of folder so that uh, uh, with a kind of unique identifier that isn't reliant on the exhibit uh, number because obviously exhibit numbers, you could, you could have lots of the same ones. So uh, within that folder, you would then have all the, the data that's been identified by Databelt as um, uh, the uh, most important data, that, the essential data that you need to keep. Um, that ID then is used by Databelt for it to kind of manage the data. But at all times, you would be able to access the um, your exhibit data from that folder. And that would also be linked through to the forces or the law enforcement agency's case management system, I presume, and have the same reference number. So you've always got that unique uh, ID going all the way through the case. Yeah, one of the things we can do is, is we look to to include in that unique identifier things like those crime crime numbers um, and and things that are so that that just from someone looking at it they could identify what that folder is relating to. Okay, great. Um, looking at time, we're sort of up for forty five minutes, so we're always making sure that we we time box as best we can. So um, if there are any further questions, then please file them through, and we do our best to answer them after the session but thanks again Chris for that um, clearly a lot of information imparted there uh, we had a lot of information imparted and uh, was well received like I said at the home office show uh, recently and that was a shorter version and say so people were asking for the longer version so so thanks again for that um, I'd like to thank also obviously you who have attended um, and, and the questions which came out of it and just to say that the session has been recorded um, and will be published on the AIM YouTube TV channel. So we'll send a link when that's ready out to you and those who subscribed uh, to the session today but weren't able to attend. I have to say we've had a very, very good attendance um, from not just the UK, but as I said, outside the UK as well. Um, and just to add really that we're going to be holding other um Similar webinars, we'll be holding this sort of webinar again as well, and we'll be doing that over the, next, the coming months. Uh, there'll be a range of, of other law enforcement topics in relation to data, and most importantly, how we bring in technology to do the heavy lifting around data challenges that uh, law enforcement and police forces are encountering. So they, they're coming up in the coming months. So please check out our website uh, for what those future events are. That's at www.aimltd. Dot uk and you'll have the information about what those are the topics uh, when they're going to be run so thank you again for that um as i said once uh, once the link is ready we'll send that out to you if you do have any further questions please feel free to contact myself or chris or just write into the the general aim uh, emails and we do our very very best to answer those and get back to you and of course we're always interested in feedback on this session and any experiences you've got you may want to share uh, where we can actually possibly have a discussion or assist with what your challenges are. So thank you, everybody. Good afternoon to those in the UK. Uh, yep. If you're outside the UK, uh, good morning and good evening to you Bye. too. <laughs> and uh, look forward to um, hopefully seeing you again at some point soon. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks Goodbye. very much indeed. Bye-bye.